support in the government tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Lewis. Thank, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The measures that we're debating today expose what's been happening to our country since 2010. In the name of deficit reduction and fiscal responsibility, the Tories have allowed the poorest and most vulnerable to become poorer and even more vulnerable. A Prime Minister who once courageously warned her own party they was perceived by too many as the nasty party is presiding over a government which has a cavalier disregard for social justice and the poverty which shames our country. It is true that in the aftermath of a global financial crisis, any UK government would have had to make tough choices striking the right balance between spending cuts, tax increases and investment in growth. However, the reality is that too often they've made the wrong choices. <coughs> choices motivated by an ideological project to wither the state, irrespective of its impact on local communities, the poorest in our society and growth. Their disproportionate cuts have choked... I'll give way to the... Uh, could he just remind us all that a note had been left by a member of his government that said quite properly there was no money left. And in fact, what this government has done is not only restore our economy, but in so doing, it has absolutely protected those very people that matter to all of us. And this is tribal nonsense. I have a lot of respect for the Honourable Lady, but to claim that the financial crisis was anything other than as a consequence of a crash which started on Wall Street is the biggest distortion of history that we listen to uh, uh, in, this, in this country. And if this... Uh, I'll give way once more to... Well, the Honourable Gentleman's rewriting history, because the fact of it is, if the Labour government had fixed the roof when the sun was shining, when that crisis came along, it could have weathered the storm. That's what this responsible government's been doing since 2010. Yeah. The Honourable Ladies' Party... Uh, didn't, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, wanted us to regulate the banks and the financial services sector less than the regulatory system that we had in place. They committed to matching our spending and borrowing, and they didn't want us to rescue the banks. Imagine if that prescription had been followed at the time we were dealing with that financial crisis. This, the government's choices are motivated by an ideological project to wither the state irrespective of its impact. Their disproportionate cuts have cho choked off growth and destroyed too much of our social fabric. Their tax changes have failed dismally to tackle tax avoidance or in tough times ensure those with the most carry the greatest burden. Their failure to invest in infrastructure, skills and jobs has led to economic growth which is anemic compared to similar economies. The Government's own assessments predict this economic failure will be made even worse by the uncertainty and instability which is the inevitable consequence of Brexit. And maybe the Honourable Lady will agree with me on this point. History will record the referendum was nothing to do with the national interest or giving voice to the will of the people. It was David Cameron's fix for managing the Tory party through a general election. I'm not giving way again to the Honourable Lady. Far from being the party of economic competence, they are the party of economic chaos. To be clear, the policies that we are opposing today are neither um, necessary or are they acceptable in a civilised society. They are political choices made by this Tory government. Members of the party opposite, as we have heard today during the course of this debate, are in denial. Too many of our fellow citizens may as well be living in a different country than the one that they describe. Their reality, Mr Deputy Speaker, is food banks, perpetual debt, a poor quality of life and a lack of hope for themselves and their children. Some, of course, are dependent on benefit, but increasing numbers of people in work on permanent low pay and insecure contracts. This should offend any member of this House who believes in social justice but also cares about the future of mainstream politics. Increasingly, we see here and abroad people who feel left behind by mainstream politics turning to anti-establishment nationalism, which spreads hate and division. Well, that's another reason these policies are so irresponsible. I'll give way to the Honourable. But a few months ago, he denigrated Brexit and that his own area of Berry voted to leave in the European Union. How do you think that would have uh, helped with the politics of uh, disenfranchising people and making them tend towards extremes? The, the Honourable Gentleman misses, entirely misses the point. Of course I believe that the result of the referendum must be respected. I question the motive 
for the referendum in the first place. It is David Cameron's folly, and that's how he will be remembered in yes. history. And it was done for the interests of the Conservative Party, not the interests of our country. De I'll give way one last time. I have to have respect some, but it's beginning to wane. But I'm not going to fall out, Don Gentleman, but I would make this point to him. It is not good enough sent just to blame it all on David Cameron, because he, like me, walked through the lobbies, as did the majority of people in this House, to support a referendum. We are now dealing with the consequences, but we are all complicit in agreeing that the British people would vote and determine whether we stayed or we left. I simply say to the Honourable Lady, and I think history will bear this out, that it was purely to keep the Conservative Party together to get through a general election. It was nothing to do with the national interest and the arrogance of the then Prime Minister and Chancellor that they would almost inevitably win such a referendum. Mr Deputy Speaker, turning to the measures we're debating here today, in terms of universal credit and free school meals, the Government could hardly make more of a mess of universal credit. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, the National Audit Office stated the project has suffered from weak management, ineffective control and poor governance. Is that the responsibility of the current Secretary of State or the predecessor Secretary of State? Perhaps the Secretary of State would like to respond. Um, it says weak management, ineffective control and poor governance. Secretary of State? OK. Cuts to universal credit legislated in the last two years have left a majority of families worse off on universal credit than the system it replaces, and this further reduction in support will add to their financial pain. The proposed threshold has the potential to have a negative effect on work incentives and risk creating poverty traps for families on universal credit, going completely against the Government's goal that universal credit should always reward work. Mr Deputy Speaker, in the 1980s, Tory policies created a deeply divided society. They've learnt nothing from history and are once again fueling a cycle of intergenerational deprivation. A deprivation which hurts those most affected. But in the end, Mr Deputy Speaker, damage us all. I hope the House today will force the Government to rethink these regressive measures. Um, by talking about the math